Welcome back to the Hank Strange Situation, Lifestyles of the Locked and Loaded. Make sure to check out HankStrange.com. You can sign up for our email list and find ways to follow and support our efforts. Welcome back to the channel. I'm Hank Strange. Today, this How It's Made video that we're doing with Sam Andrews of Andrews Custom Leather. We're going to talk about making a leather belt. Red strong belt. Yes. Uh, very important, right? A, a belt is a foundation of manhood, <laughs> in my opinion. Maybe going a little far, mm -hmm. but a good stout belt keeps everything together. Yeah, keep your pants up uh, if you've got things clipped to it or going around it and stuff like that. So very important, and we thought we would... Do you think anyone can make a belt? It is probably the simplest concept bit of leather work that okay. you can start with, and probably one of the most frequently made projects. Absolutely. So we're going to show you how to make a belt from the beginning to the end, all the tools you need, um, all of that kind of stuff. We'll give you advice. We're getting into it right now. In order to make a belt, you don't need too many tools. They're pretty simple. You could do it with a knife by itself, but that would be the hard way. I start with a strap cutter. These are available from most leather supply houses. It's got inches gradation along the cutter bar. You can move it for how wide a strap you want to start with. There's a little fixed razor blade in this end. So you can, so you've got the straight edge on your leather. You can draw as many straps and belt blanks as you wish. Did you make that? No, this is commercially made. Again, you get them from almost any leather supply house. This one's from Tandy, but many places carry them. First thing to do, have some leather. I've got a hide here of saddle skirting. That's about the heaviest thickness leather that you'll be able to acquire. It's anywhere from 12 to 15 ounces in thickness. In leather speak, an ounce is a 64th of an inch. I have no idea why we now call them ounces. It's one of those traditions. So starting with good, strong leather, you'll get a belt that won't warp and curl and lose its strength on you like those Naga Hyde department store things. Okay. So, first thing is cut a straight edge along one end of the belt. I just use a long yardstick and my razor knife. Once we've got this straight edge made, it's really quite simple. Bring the strap cutter in firmly against the straight edge of the belt. Pull toward you. I find I hold the outer edge of the belt blank as I'm pulling, which keeps it coming inward toward me. If I don't hold the outer edge, sometimes it can veer off and then you don't have an accurate straight blank to work with. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> that's cool. Once you've got the first straight edge done, no problem. And I cut them pretty well the length of the hide because you can always cut them down to whatever you need. This way, whatever the customer orders, you've got a full length blank available. Awesome. Without a strap cutter, you're up with a knife and some kind of straight edge drawing down along and it's not going to make anywhere near as clean an edge, so you'll have a lot more work to do to slick it and bevel it and dress it to be nice. Once you have your blank cut, you need to cut the ends and then measure for length. I make some belt end patterns, the pointy bit with the holes in it, and then for the buckle end, you can do one or two holes for your connecting hardware. I like to put two because I can capture the keeper in between, and then a slot for the tongue of the buckle to move in. Starting with one end of the belt, and place the pattern along, trace the tip that we're going to cut, and mark the holes. I've got these holes at one inch intervals. You can do them three quarter inch, half an inch, whatever pleases you. You just need to make sure you leave enough 
leather in between the holes for strength. If you cut the holes too close together, it can tear through with time. Now, sizing for length is the most critical thing. We don't want our belts too long or too short. I've created this belt gauge by first knowing my own waist size. I put the leather around myself and I marked where the two ends came together. It's 36 inches. So starting there with 36, and again using one inch intervals, I was able to go below and above and mark all the holes for their waist size. You can't really go by just the length on the tape measure because the belt is going over your pants and other things that bulk it up and it may not actually be the exact same distance around the person as it is on the yardstick. So this gave me a reliable measure to go by. We're going to make this belt 36 inches long because I have a lot of clients in that range. So I'm taking the 36 hole and I'm lining that up with the hole in the middle. There are seven holes total here. You can make as many as you like. By starting it in the center, the person wearing it has room to go up and down as nature dictates. Keeping that aligned, I come to this end and right in the middle of my slot, I've drawn a line and I just line up with that, put a little pen mark, which I will then put in the middle of the slot on the pattern. This is where it's going to bend over to hold the buckle. So halfway through the slot will be the end of the belt once it's bent. Trace this. Mark all the holes. Now the belt's laid out and ready for cutting. I like to cut using my knife and carpet method. Piece of scrap carpet, and then I'm cutting with the point of my X-Acto knife going forward away from me. By doing this, it gives me a lot of control the point of the knife is going into the carpet. It's not striking the hard top of the table. It allows me with these short sawing motions to make a complete cut through and to have good control steering it. It's almost starting to look like a belt now. The thing you'll spend the most time on making a belt is the edges. These are square. They're square and sharp edged as they've just been cut straight out of the cowhide. Dressing and slicking the edge will take more time than any other process involved here. You don't have to do this part, but I like to groove an edge. It just as an accent, it makes the belt look better. If it's a double layered belt and I'm going to stitch it, the groove gives me a guide for the stitching. This is the simpler, just one layer heavy leather. And so this is decorative, but using the groover, again, available from almost any leather supply store, you set the width of your cutter, or whatever you like, place the silver knob against the side of the belt on the straight leather and draw it toward you and the sharp little hole in the cutter is going to cut the groove leaving this long string of leather spaghetti following behind. I like to go over the groove twice to get it really deep and noticeable. It's not necessary but we're trying to look good here.
Now we've got the groove going all the way around. The next thing is to bevel it. Beveler is a cutter made to take the square edge off of the strap or any leather you're working with. I've become fond of these changeable blade bevelers. They have one handle, many different blades, different sizes. They're quite sharp, they're easy to strop, and they have a rounded cutting surface. So you get a very nice round edge when you bevel. Who makes those? I buy them from Weaver Leather, and I'm having a hard time reading the mark on it. Hold on, let me see if I could. So old school trick with the phone, mm -hmm. you triple tap it, and then you could see, and this says a uh, horseshoe hand tool, uh, no, horseshoe brand tool. Horseshoe brand, so big shout out to yeah. Horseshoe Brand yeah. for making an excellent tool. <laughs> I've used a very large blade on the back to get quite a rounded cut. In order not to get a knife edge to the leather, you don't want a super heavy bevel on each side. You want a rounded edge, not something coming to a point. I've changed to the next size down, slightly smaller beveler to cut the smooth leather on the top. And which ones you use will depend on how thick the material is you're working with. With thinner material, I'd use much smaller bevel blades. Now we've got it beveled both sides, but it's still rough. Now we're going to do some slicking and get everything glassy smooth and laid down. Now you can do the slicking entirely by hand. It's more labor intensive. I cheat. I've made a slicking bar for this old grinder motor. Spinning toward me. I give the leather a good soaking down. You want it quite wet for this. Then I bring it up against the bar. Since it's turning towards me, that means the slicking action is all going down the length of the belt. Well, when you're slicking, you want the edge at least very wet so that these fibers will all lay down in that direction. There are degrees though, when you're slicking by hand, you may just want it damp instead of soaking so that when you press against it and rub it with the slicking tool, it doesn't just mushroom and squish out to the sides. And there's a cure for that too, which I shall demonstrate after we do the hand slicking portion of this. The machine slicking has done about 80% of the job. Now we'll do the fine finishing by hand to get that really slick, glassy, polished edge. Now, with the machine slicking, laying all the fibers down in the one direction, 
I'm going to get it polished by hand. You can use a rough denim, a piece of blue jeans, something, and slick in that direction to polish it. Another handy thing is a little plastic pulley wheel. You can get these at various hardware stores. They usually come attached to some metal flange. You can pop out the pin and just keep the wheel. This makes a very good tool for doing the ends. Just rub back and forth. I give it a little twist, so I'm gripping the top and bottom edge while I do this. And get that first five or six inches nice and glassy smooth. Because I'm going to be holding on to this end while I polish with the denim. I just put my hand inside the old pants leg, grip this on both sides, and pull in a single direction. You can grip from the front or the back. I alternate. And this lays the fibers down, gives it that hardened, polished edge, and really comes out looking professional. Wheel on the back. Now, inevitably, the edge has mushroomed a little from all the pressure that's being put on it while it's wet. It's spread out somewhat. So, take any hard, smooth item. This is just a piece of polished Delrin plastic. And I press everything down flat again. There. That feels like glass. But when you have your finished belt, anyone who picks it up is going to notice how well finished and professional it feels. The final thing, once we've got it all edged and cut, is to pop in the holes so we can install the hardware. On the holes, for the tongue, I'm using just a 3 16 inch punch, again, available from any leather supply. I've got in the habit of going over the holes and giving it a tap to dent each one. That way I can visually determine that I am right on my marks and I'm not wandering to either side or back or forth. And it's easy to place it back in because you can feel when the punch goes into that mark that you've dented in. Takes an extra second, keeps me from having to start all over again and using foul language. Sometimes when you're punching the heavy leather, the punch doesn't want to come out, have to sort of rock it to get it to free. Swapping to the buckle end. Same practice on the holes for the hardware. And then you use what's called a bag punch, a long, a long punch for the slot for the buckle tongue. These are available again, many sizes from almost any leather supply house. This is an inch and a quarter. You can use smaller ones, longer ones. I just find this gives me a good scope for the arc of the buckle. And finally, to get this bent, I'm going to wet the leather here because I'm going to bend it back rather sharply and I don't want it cracking. So white leather, more limber, gives you the is the flexibility to get it into shape. I look through the holes, make sure I've got my holes lined up, and then I just lean 
I hand on the leather where it's bent, get a good crease in it, and now this can dry, and once dry, you can apply color finish. Now that the belt's all together, all this needs to do is dry, and then you can put on whatever color finish that you prefer. There's one small item we still need, and that's the keeper. The keeper is the, the little loop of leather that keeps the, the end of the belt from flopping in the breeze. So for keepers, I'm using about a four or five ounce leather. Just cut a straight strap. I've grooved the edges just because I'm fussy and I've got to decorate everything. Lay the belt over two layers, wrap this around to make sure the ends of the keeper material are coming together. That way you know you've got enough to go around the whole belt. You can attach the ends many ways. You can overlap them and stitch them. You can put a rivet in. What I prefer to do is use the keeper staple, which is made exactly for this. You can get them from many leather supply houses. It's a simple little thing. You punch a hole, a slot actually, near each end, put the keeper's staple in the slots, push it through, and then using a screwdriver, you just fold the ends over inside. To make it really secure, I grab it with pliers and really press down on it. You can use the loop just as is, but I have to be fancy. So we've made a former for those. We made sure the wood was as thick as two layers of the leather here. It's got very squared off edges. I slide the keeper over there and you can bang it with a hammer on the ends or you can take any hard smooth piece and mold the sides and that creates a rectangular keeper which will be much easier for the belt to slide through. This we place on the belt right in between the two hardware holes. That way when the buckle's installed and the screw posts or rivets are placed in these holes, the keeper is captured in between and it's not sliding about and liable to slide off the belt and get lost. At this point, choose your color, choose your type of buckle to put on. You're in business with a good stout belt. All right, Sam, so to wrap this up here, obviously the final step is you want to finish this, exactly. dry, et cetera, right? Once the leather has dried and a good afternoon in the sun will get it dry, you can finish it with uh, neat's foot oil, dye, many colors. Mm -hmm. you, know, you can get instruction from your leather supply house, what finishes work and how to apply them. Mm -hmm. We've gone over that in many other videos, so I don't want to add unnecessary time at this point. Yeah, so maybe some options of what someone could do if they wanted right. to get a little complicated. Now what we showed is the very basic belt. One layer, heavy leather, attach a buckle, you've got a belt. Right. But there's more than one flavor of ice cream. So, for people who prefer, some of the belts are made lined. Mm -hmm. This one has a suede lining. Suede is a soft split cowhide. It's very soft and rough on the inside. The advantage of it is anything you put on that belt, like your knife pouch or phone or whatever, is not going to slide around because the, the coarse suede is going to grab a hold okay. of it between you and Creates the belt. friction. Exactly. Okay. And being a soft material, it doesn't make the belt any stiffer. It remains as flexible as the leather part. Okay. The other options are a leather-lined belt, or some people call it a double thick. It's another layer of face leather added to the inside, glued together, these are thicker and they're also stiffer belts. So if you were carrying a heavy weight of something on your belt, tools or something, the leather line, the double thick belt would give you more support. Okay. Now, sometimes we also do decorative work. This one is stamped. When the leather is wet, you can stamp impressions into it. This is called border stamp because it goes around the border. The border. Uh -huh. This is fancy stitch which is a traditional Western design, it's a diamond oval, diamond oval repeating pattern. Mm -hmm. 
And there's other things like basket weave or people put names in, decorations, whatever your heart yeah. desires. Yeah, that just goes up from your creativity. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, how long do you think it would take someone to do this? I know this, how long it takes you guys to do it. Well, I've had a little practice and yeah. I've got all the tools on hand. Mm -hmm. You know, making that unlined belt, basic belt, didn't take me very long. Mm -hmm. Simplest project you can do. Uh, lined belts take longer, you have to glue in the lining, trim off the excess, maybe sand the edges, there's more finishing work involved. Decorative belts, it depends. Uh, when Dominic, my assistant, does a carved belt, that takes him hours and hours because he's doing deep detail floral carving, the length yeah, of it. Yeah, so beautiful. They're lovely, but they're very time consuming. Yeah, time consuming, <laughs> absolutely. So uh, the selfish part of this, if the mm -hmm. folks out there are looking to just buy a belt, right. <laughs> which I would be in that category, and I do wear your belts, you. uh, what do they do if they want to order these? They call us directly at the shop or go to andrewsleather.com, our online catalog. You can see all the variations, all the prices, different colors and finishes. There's a lot to choose from. Awesome. All right, guys, so uh, we'll leave all that info in the description for anyone who's looking for it. I would encourage you guys to leave like questions, comments, and stuff like that. We'll try to get Sam to answer some of those. <laughs> or you could call him. <laughs> well, we're here every waking Need hour. phone call. <laughs> yeah, right. Yes, absolutely. Um, thanks so much. Make sure you guys leave those comments and all that kind of stuff. Uh, make sure you smash the thumbs ups, ring the bell so you can be notified every time we put these videos up. Sam, thanks so much for A taking the time indeed. here. Indeed, thank you for coming around. Same here. Always fun to be in St. Augustine, hanging out with you. Uh, you know, this we, we could be on the beach, but this is fun. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, well, the beach is for people who don't have work. Absolutely. <laughs> the beach is for playing. The shop is for working. That's what we're doing. We'll see you guys. Make sure to check out HempStrange.com. You can sign up for our email list and find ways to follow and support our efforts.